Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Stom TV Podcast. My name is Jason Wise. Glad to have you listening. On today's pod, we're going to talk about what I still think is one of the greatest stories in all of wine. And every single time I get past Malbec World Day, I start thinking about how Malbec has impacted the wine industry, and in particular, one country of Argentina. And then I think about the little place that still grows it in France, and it makes my head spin. I just love this story. Claire Kopi from Som TV and eponymous winemaker Paul Hobbs from Sonoma, who makes wine literally all over the entire world, both going to join me on the podcast today. And we're going to talk about the history of Malbec and how it came to define an entire nation and what happened when that happened. Before we do that, I do want to say, if you're looking for things like this story, stories of grapes, stories of regions, education and entertainment in the food world and especially the wine space, Som TV is the place. If you're listening to this, you're not a subscriber. What are you waiting for? It's time now. SomTV.com, $49.99 for an entire year. And we have dozens of videos that have to do with Malbec, dozens of videos that have to do with Burgundy, dozens of videos about Syrah, everything you can think of, you can find there on Som TV. So go to SomTV.com and subscribe, $49.99 for an entire year. Claire, it is always a pleasure to have you back on the Psalm TV podcast. And always a pleasure to be here, but especially to celebrate World Malbec Day. <laughs> this is one that every time it comes, I want to retell or expand upon the story of Malbec. It sort of encompasses everything I love about wine. The history, the way wine seems to attach itself to humanity and travel with us, whether we know that it's doing it or not. You know, it exemplifies all the trends in wine. It really does. It just shows how wine sneaks its way into our lives and finds a way to become important. And there's like this secret battle with all these grapes. They're all trying to be found, trying to be seen, trying to be important. What I want to try to do with this is first let's start with what do you think of when we talk about Malbec? What is the thing that comes to mind for you? Well, for me, certainly before I even got into wine, I would think Argentina. The very first Malbec I had was an Argentinian Malbec. And then as I started studying and learning more about wine and beginning my wine journey, I learned, no, 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 this grape actually comes from southwestern France, but it most famously was part of Bordeaux. It blows my mind to think about the the impact those grapes have had. And, you know, we'll get into phylloxera and things that have changed that region so much, but how they have changed the world of wine. I mean, there are billions of dollars that are spent every single year around the world on grapes just from that little place, oh, a port yeah. city in southwest France. Before we get into Malbec, let's talk about some of the grapes that came from Bordeaux and kind of how they got mm -hmm. cast about the world. And we'll get to Malbec right after that. So let's talk about Bordeaux. What are the grapes that come to mind for you? Well, I think for everybody, for most everybody out there, the first grape, especially the first red grape that you think of when you think of Bordeaux, is Cabernet Sauvignon. That is sure. arguably the superstar red grape of the world. The most popular, the most recognized, except for maybe Pinot Noir, but speaking of Bordeaux varietals, Cabernet Sauvignon is the king, right? You are finding so many high-quality wines made from Cabernet Sauvignon dominant blends, single varietal Cabernet Sauvignons. It's changed wine laws. It's changed wine regions. When you look at something like Super Tuscans in Italy, it's because they wanted the recognition to be able to grow Bordeaux-style red blends. So that's that's the big one, definitely, Cabernet Sauvignon. For sure. And then you have kind of the ugly stepsister, unfortunately. Really doesn't deserve it, but that's going to be Merlot. Merlot. I would Merlot. I would marry Merlot. <laughs> I would, uh, you know, if I was hey. a part of that rich family, I would be like, look, I'll take You'll take you know, Merlot. This daughter is not not that ugly, so and I'm she, in. And you might be happier in the long run. She might be a little <laughs> less uh, high maintenance, right? Uh, <laughs> not touching that. <laughs> Merlot got a bad rap. I mean, there was uh, and still is, unfortunately, some very poor Merlots being made out there. I would argue there are some pretty poor Cabernet Sauvignons being produced as well. But uh, Merlot is another one of those main grapes and red blends, uh, getting a lot of nice attention in Washington State, also in California State. Uh, you'll see some Merlot blends down in Australia as well. Then the other main red grape of Bordeaux being Cabernet Franc, a grape I love, a grape that sommeliers love, one of the parents of Cabernet Sauvignon. This uh, thrives and shines really beautifully as a single varietal wine in the Loire Valley of France. I mean, Cabernet Franc is something, we'll we'll do a whole episode on Cab Franc that gets deep into it. I, I happen to adore. I, I love mean, it. This, 
this one. What about some of the the lesser known ones? Like, let's go to like Petit Verdot. Petit Verdot and yeah, also Malbec, the kind of two, the two little babies that get thrown in in small percentages in blends. Petit Verdot is kind of stuck around as a blending grape. Mostly you'll see in some regions, winemakers experimenting with single varietals. I recently had a single varietal Petit Verdot at Carhartt Vineyards up in Santa Barbara. And it was pretty good, not gonna lie. So you, you see some experimentation going on there, but nobody is really focusing on primarily single varietal Petit Verdots at the moment. We should also mention what probably really is the ugly stepsister, which is Carbonier that ended up, has a very oh, similar story. No, we're just going to mention it. <laughs> um, that has a very similar story to Malbec, but in, you know, across the Andes in Chile. That's not what this pot is about, but there's a really fascinating thing that leads to Malbec and that all of these grapes were all being grown for very different reasons. And they were all being blended. It was not about the grape. It was about the region. It always, you know, that's what France is still. They don't, they name things after where is it grown, not what is grown. That takes us to Malbec. Is this mean to say Malbec maybe is the luckiest grape in the history of grapes? I mean, when you really think about how important it is, how well known it is, I mean, mm -hmm. does this grape have any business being as important as it is, and I'm not saying because it doesn't taste good. I'm not talking about its actual qualities. I'm just talking about what happened. It's very lucky to have gotten to where it is today. It should be almost non-existent. <laughs> we have to talk slightly about a little bit of the way things go throughout history. And as history teaches us, things go in and out of trends. They become more important. Sometimes a wine that's more accessible is the most drank. I mean, look at Yellowtail today. Look at the wines you can buy the easiest are often some of the highest selling wines. Well, if you go back to like the 12th, 13th century, and you look at who were the most powerful countries or empires or kingdoms at that time, you're going to have to put your thumb on, in the Western world at least, on England, Spain, France, Portugal, you know, the usual suspects. England drank quite a bit, especially the nobility. And in that time period, you had things like Chablis, Chablis was the most important white wine you could get. It was incredibly sought after. And part of this had to do with it was from the kingdom of Burgundy. It had to go down the rivers, but it had access to the ports. And it just became this real big fad. But guess what else was? Malbec. So Cahors is located in Bordeaux, which is a natural port. And Cahors makes Malbec. And the British at this time we're drinking tons and tons and tons of Malbec. It was a very, very, I mean, it's one of the few grapes that when you go back to that really early time in writing where everything is hand copied and if you wrote something down, it was really important. People wrote about Malbec. They wrote about this grape. They wrote about Cahors. They wrote about the region. There's not a lot of grapes you can say that about. Maybe Riesling, um, a few others. But for the most part, people were not writing down, we are drinking this for pleasure. Most of the grape writing at the time was, you know, experimentation. Monks saying this row did well, this didn't, we like this flavor, but they're not talking about the upper society drinking stuff for their pleasure. And so for Malbec to pop up in the 1200s, 1300s, is kind of incredible. So it had this moment in the sun, and then it sort of disappeared. And I think a lot of that has to do with wars. It has to do with, you know, England going to war with France, all of these other things. But then you have, I would call it, the biggest event that's ever happened to wine. You can't talk about it enough, which was phylloxera. At the time of phylloxera, which is in the 1800s when it hit Bordeaux, Bordeaux was the single most important wine exporting place, bar none, in the entire world. All the wine that went to England, all the wine that went inland in Europe, all of the important stuff that if you had money, this is what you drank. And phylloxera, a very small insect that attacks the roots, came in and devastated everything. Without phylloxera, we would not have Rioja. That region of Spain was basically, you know, they grew wine, but it was created to replace the wines of Bordeaux for mm -hmm. sales. And so you look at the things that happened because of phylloxera. But just before phylloxera, people took cuttings all around the world of these different grapes. And they, as they traveled to the New World, to Argentina, to Chile, to even America, they took all these grapes. I mean, Thomas Jefferson was experimenting a Monticello with probably Malbec, frankly. And mm -hmm. there was this incredible rare situation where they got out before this happened. I want to bring in a winemaker named Paul Hobbs. And Paul Hobbs has been on the podcast. We have a Verticals episode about him on Som TV. He's kind of a very worldly winemaker. He makes wine in 
I think five or six different countries. Uh, he makes wine and cahors, but he's very famous for really being at the forefront of experimentation while he was in Argentina in the 90s, in the late 80s, for when this happened for Malbec. So I want to bring in Paul Hobbs to talk about how it went from being a French grape to an Argentinian grape due to phylloxera. After the phylloxera uh, in Bordeaux, even though it was a very important grape in Bordeaux, after phylloxera in the 1870s, it wasn't replanted, and he thought that it was a qualitative reason, but in fact, it was because it's a very poor setting grape, meaning it would be economically challenging. From one year, you might not get a crop, and the next year, you would, and so on. So after phylloxera, they really didn't want to have another problem economically. And so they went with Cabernet, which is actually what was a relatively new variety at that period of time, a cross between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. So Claire, it's it's interesting to think that, you know, they didn't put Malbec back anywhere else except Cahors. So they didn't replant. And you have this little tiny place. It's a beautiful place, which I recommend going to strongly. It's gorgeous. But you don't have it being blended into the modern or quasi-modern, you know, last 120, 150 years, it's out of our Bordeaux blends for the most part. I find it really interesting that Cabernet Sauvignon was chosen. What is the difference between Cabernet Sauvignon from a taste profile and Malbec? Malbec, I would say, it tends to be a little bit more plush, has darker fruits, uh, some lovely chocolate notes. It tends to be a little bit lower in uh, structural components like tannin and acid that Cabernet Sauvignon is a wee bit higher in a bit more uh, earthiness in Cabernet Sauvignon potentially as well. And it has, of course, that pyrazinic note, the uh, green bell pepper note that Cabernet Sauvignon is can be famous for. And you have this grape that's a lot easier to grow in Bordeaux, Cabernet Sauvignon is, than Malbec was, as uh, Paul Hobbs mentioned, which would have been a much bigger gamble after this huge uh, devastation across Europe, but in Bordeaux specifically. So it makes a lot more sense to plant a more vigorous, friendly-to-grow grape. Malbec, very finicky. It likes water on its own terms. Uh, that was It goes into part of the reason why, for a long time, it wasn't doing so well in Argentina before Paul Hobbs came in and kind of tweaked some things around and helped that industry boom. But it sort of feels like Malbec is like just waiting for a discovery. You know, much like what happened with Carmenere in Chile, a lot of people didn't even know Malbec was in their vineyards in Argentina. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had, I mean, some people did. It's not, you know, the Catenas, you know, had many, many, many plantings of Malbec. But it was like sort of just hanging there waiting to be known. And I think the fruitiness of it, you know, a lot of people, they may not like sweet wines anymore, but they definitely like fruit forward wines. I mean, we know mm -hmm. this. I mean, it is what sells. If you go into, you know, a wine shop, there's a very strong reason they have you know, Malbecs, Merlots, all of these things, they fly off the shelves. All sommeliers and wine professionals can thumb their nose on a lot of these wines, but the fact is people drink them, people like them. And it's just a really odd trajectory, I think, for a grape to have been sort of cast out and then mm -hmm. not let back in the door. But the interesting thing is it did survive. So we have to go back to the 1800s, late 1800s, when lots of clippings were brought over to Argentina and Malbec ended up establishing itself in Argentina. And Argentina has gone through a lot of political strife. I don't know if anybody here has seen the movie Avida. I, I wouldn't call it the most historically <laughs> accurate film that's ever been made. Um, but I would say it gives you a picture of some of the political turmoil that Argentina has undergone over the last maybe 100 years. I could say we were filming there. And while we were filming Cup of Salvation and a bunch of stuff that are that is coming for Som TV, one of their banknotes, it was like a $2 note was phased out in the middle of us being there. So I had a ton of these $2 notes that were just mm. toilet paper while we were... <laughs> I mean, I was <laughs> given them when I came into the country, and while I was there, they were turned into nothing. And it's indicative of this up and down, inflation, deflation, problems they've had. They've had dictators. And yeah. what that really did, and I think it's great to, to go back to Paul here in a second, to mm. talk about how the hell it went from... There are some vines in Argentina to, you know, what did it take to get to the next step with Malbec in Argentina? Let's let's hear from Paul when he walked into the country and they were looking at vines and it sort of sparked with him. I was searching for new opportunity outside of California, outside the U.S. actually. And I was also looking at the opportunities to start my own business. As we entered into Mendoza, 
I saw a vineyard, which actually happens to be pretty much where we are today. And what I didn't know is, even though it was harvest time, I, I'd never seen that variety. It, was, it happened to be Malbec, and it caught my eye. It was fascinating, uh, different. It's morphology and the flavor of the grape and so on and so forth. So what is it? And he said, oh, it's a Bordeaux varietal. But actually, it's from Cahors, French, which is about two and a half hours southeast of Bordeaux. Then I went out to the eastern part of the province of Mendoza to what I guess is Esmeralda, which was the Catena family high-end winery, and tried their wines. And as advertised, they were among the worst wines I'd ever tasted in my life. They were truly horrible. <laughs> But that, that's what people have been saying about Argentina. is too warm, it was this or that or the other thing. They didn't have good equipment or technology. One of the big problems was that the wines were oxidized. At any rate, they were doing almost everything wrong, but I didn't understand why they were doing it wrong and why they had such good vineyards and at the same time making such poor wine. And so that really got my curiosity about the possibilities, about the quality of the fruit. What people didn't know, or I didn't know well, was that Argentina had been isolationist for over 40 years. And that's one of the reasons their equipment was so abysmal. I mean, they, they had knockoffs of European equipment because they couldn't import better equipment. So the industry here made equipment to try to make wine, but it was really rudimentary and rustic. And so that was one of the main reasons that they were unable to control some of the basics of winemaking. Even after we made the first wine, we didn't bottle that first wine, we just sold it here in the local market. But the next year we had barrels, the first French oak barrels ever imported into the country. But the wine had suffered tremendously. That whole effort, that whole year's effort was destroyed from oxidation in the bottling line. So we invested in a new bottling line and et cetera, et cetera. We formed a team we called anti-oxidation team. <laughs> We got t-shirts for everybody to make them aware of the importance of this sort of thing. And we built like that. What I didn't recognize when I first came to Argentina is that there's violent hailstorms here as a result of the high Andes and the moist, warm air flowing in from the Pampa. So when those two collide, it makes enormous thunderheads. And so to prevent damage to, to grapes, what growers try to do is keep the fruit as low to the ground as possible, cocoon it inside the uh, chutes. So we had to change that system, but to do it, we needed a way to defend against the hailstorms to make the growers comfortable with modern canopy management. So that meant raising the fruit wire to uh, the typical level that we see today, which is about 30 inches above the ground, raising the entire canopy. That was scary for growers, so we introduced the net which was an idea we, we largely borrowed from the Piedmont district of Italy. So to get to where we are today, Malbec had to go through quite a series of steps. When we began these changes in the viticulture, that led to a new way of growing Malbec. And so the berries, when we began growing it that way in 1991, the berry became much smaller because we were irrigating less. The rachis or the stem redder, we opened up the fruit zone, so there's a good light filtering into the canopy and so on. And it was like a wholly different creature. I mean, I think the opportunity with what Malbec was is clearly obvious. And I think you have to have maybe what Paul was able to bring was an outsider's perspective. And I mm. think that being somebody who, look, let's face it, Sonoma is not the hardest place to make wine. Mm -hmm. You know, neither is Napa, but also you have the technology. You know, I mean, you have yeah. the things that can help you. And I, it's interesting to think about the economic issues Argentina has had and link that directly to the quality of wine. Hmm. There's really nobody but Paul as an outsider who could have seen this and then said, hey, why don't we try a few different things? And I should say in this pod, the Catanas deserve a tremendous amount of credit for what Malbec is, why it's so important, and why it's actually so damn good um, in the world market, especially from Argentina. But Paul really was there as an outsider to say there's there's possibilities here with this grape. And I want to go back to him after we talk really quickly about just a grape identifying a country. I mean, Claire, can you think of a single grape <laughs> that people think is from a place that is not? I mean, Malbec is French. Yeah, not in this, not at this level. I was trying to think about that earlier. If there is another grape that was so fully embraced and adopted 
by a different country that it's now be they've become synonymous with each other that it's become that nation's grape and i can't really put my finger on another one i think this is the ultimate example of how grapes can evolve and change and the only one i can think of and it comes to mind is shiraz and now shiraz in in australia is genetically syrah right but they just named it something different. It's kind of like Fumé Blanc and Sauvignon Blanc yeah. and Napa. It's like, it, it's it's not the same because mm. I would ultimately say, if you ask me where Sh- Syrah is the most famous or the best, I would I would mm-hmm. unequivocally go to France. There'd be no yeah. question. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't skip a beat. Now, if you say Shiraz, I would say nobody else would call it that except Australia. <laughs> so I guess they have cornered the market on that. But Balbec, you're right. It's completely unique in its being the identity of an entire country. And this is when, you know, at this point, they were able to get the vines together. They were able to get wine that was of a, of a decent quality. And what I'm most interested in is this moment when the spark happened, the explosion. Mm. When did it happen? How did it happen? And, you know, it's interesting to hear Paul's perspective because as an outsider, he was there on the ground level. So let's hear Paul talk about this sort of moment that Melbeck sort of took off. So we went and tried the wine, and, and one, one of the writers said, well, this is, this is a game changer for Argentina. He went back, wrote an article for the Seattle Times, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. And while he talked about our Chardonnay, I mean, he basically said, this is the future of Argentina is Malbec. And that forced us into making Malbec with launching Malbec into the United States market. And that was our vehicle by which we did that which was 1984, 1995, that we launched for the first time Malbec into the U.S. market. And by the way, it wasn't that popular even in Argentina. It was used as a basic blender. And most wines, at least when I showed up in Argentina, which is 1988, 1989, I began my consulting. Most wines, Malbec was just, in fact, a lot of the vineyards were being pulled out because of this problem of set. And so they wanted a a more reliable, high production variety. So a lot of the Malbec was being yanked. And so all of this that we did stopped that. All those old vineyards were saved as a result of that. And Malbec became kind of a a big fashion. It exploded? It exploded. It went from U.S. to Canada to the U.K., but the U.S. was the main driver. And actually, then it came to Argentina. Today, if you go to Argentina, you'd think, well, Malbec has been there since it was first brought there by... Puget in 1870, but it was there, but only for, as a blending grape, it was never, rarely used on the label. Most of Argentina, like 50% of the population rooted from Italy and a large portion from Spain. So that's why they speak Spanish. But here they have the one French varietal that has become king. And part of the story is because it was brought there by a French horticulturist who fell in love with an Argentine woman. And so he brought it there in the 70s. Well, it was one of the things about Malbec is that was, if you give it a lots of water, it, it puts on pretty good weight. <laughs> so, and it set reasonably well in the Argentine semi-desert climate at high elevation. And it was easy drinking. The, the tannins were supple and really soft and juicy. And so those were probably the characteristics that led to its proliferation. Do you think when most people think of Malbec, they truly think of Argentina. They really think it's an Argentine wine. Oh, yeah. I can tell you from working the floors in restaurants, working wine bars, that getting to give guests that little tidbit, that little kernel of, do you know this wine is actually French? They'd be like, get out. You know, they'd have that really? wine moment. Oh, yeah. They'd, they'd have be that like, no, it's not. Moment. It's from Argentina. <laughs> yeah, no. That is basically the marketing agency's dream of any product. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you couldn't you couldn't pay a billion dollars to a marketing agency to to be like this is our identity. This is the thing we do. And when you talk to sommeliers, I know like Andres Rosenberg and, and several people that are prominent sommeliers in Buenos Aires and other places, I talk to them and they're, they're so quick to say, "But we make other stuff. We make great cabernet, mm. we make this." And then, mm. you know, after a couple of minutes they go, "But, you know, we do make <laughs> great Malbec, and that's what we're known for. We had the really unique opportunity to taste Paul's first vintage Mm. uh, that he ever, you know, that he ever did with his winery, Vina Cobos, in the 90s. And I want to play this whole clip of Paul opening this wine. Now, this takes place, geez, I mean, this is a long time. So for him, this is very nostalgic. I want to play this whole clip of Paul tasting 
his first vintage of Malbec that he made. This is 1997, and this wine basically launched the company. And at that time, what really put us on the map was a huge score in the Wine Spectator. This wine earned 92 points, and maybe more important is what the writer had said, this raises the bar for Argentine Malbec, which was a huge statement and essentially put us on the map. So this is the 99, our first vintage from the Marquioia Vineyard. We're in this small department called Perdriel. And let's see how this is gonna show this now basically 20 year old wine. This is really, this cork is nothing, is, I've never seen a cork this badly disintegrated. So this is one of the reasons why people might consider using another type of closure. Also, even back in this time, we had difficulty sourcing high quality cork. So let's see how the color looks on this. Normally with such an old bottle, look at that beautiful color. So that was always one of the key questions. Would wines, not only Malbec, but particularly Malbec, would wines made in Argentina age or have ageability? And I think there's proof in the glass right there. If you see that color, absolutely spectacular. Very little brown or orange rim on that. So it's held up much better than the cork. So there's still plenty of fresh fruit showing in there. So that's really spectacular. Mm, good acidity, really, some nice red, even red currant fruit. And it's also developed this wonderful bottle bouquet, which is giving it another element of complexity. You know, it's remarkable to think that, you know, 20 years later, or even more, 22 years later, and even in those primitive times when we didn't have ideal bottling equipment and so on and so forth, but when the grapes are high quality and you've got good phenol, phenols and good acidity, the wine is absolutely superb, beautiful. I suppose we should talk about kind of food, wine, pairings type of thing with, with this grape. I'm going to ask something mean. Is there <laughs> anything where Malbec couldn't be replaced by another grape? I mean, hmm. when I think about Malbec, I, I look at it as a choice wine. The same way I look at, you know, even Cab Franc. It's not like there's mm -hmm. a there's this item of food you have to have with Cab Franc. You could probably have it with Cabernet. You could probably have yeah. it with... Is there anything that comes to your mind that Malbec is like, this is the food for Malbec? <laughs> I mean, personally, in my head, and I'm... I'm hoping you have a much more specific and eloquent answer to this. I don't I don't personally have one food that or one dish that jumps out in my head, but certainly richer grilled meats, stews, um in Cahor, the the Malbecs tend to give some kind of uh some red bell pepper kind of notes on it, uh red pepper notes. So I think, you know, some red pepper dishes with mushrooms, meats. Uh, it is a richer it's a richer wine, it's a beefier wine and it needs something that can stand up to it. Uh, without being overpowered by it. But you've been you know, to Argentina, so I'm sure you had some dishes there that knocked your socks off and make you think this and Malbec are meant to be together. Okay, first of all, I was murdered with steak in Argentina. <laughs> and uh, every go. every cut you can imagine from, you know, lamb and mostly mm -hmm. cattle. It's another podcast, but possibly the best <laughs> steak I've ever had in my entire life is down in Argentina. And they have tremendous grasslands. They do They do it right. Mm. They give you Malbec with that stuff. So for me, in my brain, I see, you know, that. But I will say there's one thing that I've had both in Cahor and in Argentina, Mendoza, is sweetbreads. And sweetbreads are not mm. an American food. In fact, when you go to France, as an American, they look at you and they go, they, they look <laughs> at you like there's no way an American would eat it. They say flat out, it's the thymus gland of the cow. It is a, yeah. it's an actual gland. It is one of the most delicious wonderful, incredible tasting things you can have. It's bursting with umami. And in Cahors, I had a version of it that was with mushrooms. I had it with mm. Malbec there. And in Argentina, they put it on the grill and it's crispy and wonderful. And inside it's very soft. I, I think it's one of the most uh, delicious things you can possibly have with Malbec. I, I know it's a weird thing, but I've traveled a lot and I think sweetbreads with Malbec is tremendous because there's something about the fruitiness on this grape even if it's made 
you know, totally different styles. It still has this kiss of fruit that, mm. I mean, I've had Cabernets that taste like I'm licking a chalkboard before. I've had Cabernets that taste like <laughs> pencil dust. I've had Cabernets that I would never describe as fruit, ever. Mm. But I've never had a Malbec where I wouldn't say there was a fruit component to it. Never in my life. The fruitiness mixed with the like kind of umami thing, that's that's where I would go with okay. the one thing where Malbec, I think, really can trump any one of these other kind of grapes is, is sweetbreads. Now, that's maybe controversial, <laughs> but but that's my... Very uh, controversial, sweetbreads. <laughs> yeah, you don't see them as much on uh, menus here anymore. They do have it at some old school places, like uh, went to Musso and Frank's recently, and they had sweetbreads on the menu. So you can find it here or there, but that's good to know. If you see it on the yeah. menu, grab a glass of Malbec. Yeah, Malbec, Malbec and sweetbreads. It's important, too, because the story of this grape is kind of the story of all grapes in the way that all of them are from somewhere else. Unless, of course, you happen to be, you know, in the Caucasus Mountains or something in Georgia or Armenia. or For the most part, they've all been taken somewhere else and they sort of take on where they're from. But mm-hmm. Malbec is the extreme example that most people listening to this podcast were alive when it exploded, when it became the thing it is today. And I don't think you can undo it. I would say happy World Malbec Day to all of you. And uh, if you meet someone on the street, just stop them, tell them to take their earbuds out, and tell them Malbec is actually from France. <laughs> Get out. Claire, it's always a, always a pleasure talking to you. I adore mm. this stuff. We have to do a Cab Franc podcast because that is one that yes. I uh, would like to down about four glasses with you. I want to remind everybody, go to SomTV.com. There are hundreds of hours of all sorts of content, including stuff on Malbec. We have an entire collection up right now that you can watch. A film about Cahors. You can watch stories about Argentina. The whole deal. And Paul Hobbs' Verticals is a must-watch. It is an incredible story about a guy who travels the whole world and really has a lot to do with a lot of the trends in wine we drink today. Go to SomTV.com, $49.99 for an entire year. And uh, if you love this podcast, please give us a great review. Wherever you listen, Apple Pods, Spotify, wherever, give a good review. It means a lot to us. I want to thank John Adams, who produced this podcast. Claire, thank you. And I want to thank Paul Hobbs for being on. Everybody be safe, get a glass of Malbec, and cheers. Cheers.